Committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare, to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to this afternoon's hearing on the importance of a diverse federal judiciary. Before we begin, I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of today's hearing. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. <clears throat> I would also ask all members to mute your microphones when you are not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I often underscore the judiciary's vital role in our great democracy. The courts are tasked with the sacred duty of administering justice and upholding the rule of law, and they must do so fairly and impartially. Yet these duties are only part of the equation that ensures that the judicial system runs smoothly. The public must also be confident that the system is as fair, impartial, and just as it pledges to be. Today, we explore an important part of ensuring the public's confidence in the courts and creating an equitable judiciary, and that is the diversity of the federal bench. By many metrics, today's judiciary is notably non-diverse and fails to reflect the communities it serves. Approximately three-fourths of Article III judges identify as white while about two thirds of Article III judges are men, leaving women and people of color largely underrepresented on the bench. Some circuit level examples highlight this striking disproportionality. The 11th Circuit, for example, which encompasses Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, states that have been historically rich with diverse population, and that today include a population that is roughly half people of color. 80% of the 11th Circuit's active judges are people, are, excuse me, 80% of the 8th Circuit's active judges are white. Just two circuit judges are people of color. And today we will hear from the Honorable Bernice Donald of the Sixth Circuit, which includes Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Michigan, states that also have a rich, rich and diverse history. Somehow in 2021, Judge Donald remains the first and only black woman to serve on that circuit. Other circuits tell a similar story. It is staggering that in today's age, there are so few opportunities for underrepresented communities to see themselves reflected on the bench. We are, of course, in a better place than we were decades ago. Courts were even more overwhelmingly white and even more overwhelmingly male. But the incremental progress we have since made is not a success story. Efforts to further diversify the bench have even regressed in recent years. And as today's numbers show on their face, there is a lot more work to be done. Diversity beyond demographic metrics also matters. Currently, judges' backgrounds tilt towards those with prosecutorial experience, with educational credentials that lean toward a limited set of law schools. We are left without the value of wide ranging professional and educational experiences that would enhance our nation's courtrooms. Now, why does this matter? A diverse, judici a diverse judiciary is vital to maintaining the public's confidence in the courts. The public perceives a judiciary that reflects a cross section of its community as fairer with the potential to be better understand, or excuse me, with the potential to better understand their realities. Judicial decision-making is also enhanced when the bench is diverse. 
a variety of narratives and perspectives must be considered and weighed, and no one set of values can dominate. As one judge once put it, quote, I think everybody is applying the same law, but you may be able to see more angles. The more angles, the better the decision, end quote. This is the first time, at least in recent history, that the committee has focused squarely on the issue of a federal of a diverse federal judiciary. Today's esteemed witnesses bring important perspectives on the vital role diversity plays, and I look forward to have to having a productive dialogue. Without objection, I would like to enter into the record a statement from the Cato Institute two reports from the Center for American Progress, and a letter from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for his opening statement. Mr. Issa, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. The subject of the hearing was uh, no surprise to me. Uh, and as we seek to expand the court in the months to come, uh, perhaps as many as 75 or 80 uh, new members, it is certainly my hope, and I join with you in believing that the new entrants to the court uh, will represent the best and the brightest, those uh, who have prepared and are able to assume one of the most difficult jobs there is, and that is to fairly execute the Constitution uh, from a position, lifetime position of great power. I will find some differences, and I believe our witnesses will show some differences, not in the goal and not in the benefit, but in fact in some preferences that I think people uh, sometimes miss. Without a doubt, when we have community policing, we want to make sure that they represent the community they live and work in. And I specifically remind us that police and fire and others who live and work in a community tend to be extremely vested and of course familiar both with the people and the neighborhoods. When we seek a jury, as everyone on both sides of the dais know, the jury is often selected by an adversarial relationship of a plaintiff and defendant. Uh, that in fact, uh, each is trying to find a jury that most closely understands their view that they will argue for. What is different and I believe unique, and we will see today, is the role that the impartial individual who sits on the dais, sometimes with a background in as a uh, 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 prosecutor, sometimes in the defense, sometimes in civil litigation, very seldom, quite frankly, with specifics of what they will have before them, whether it's labor law, patent, uh, or other criminal or civil uh, prosecutions. And they have to be able to look to the law, but more importantly, they need to be able to look at both sides, listen to both arguments, and compare it with the law and the Constitution. I believe that we will show today that although the goal of more women and more uh, broadly uh, diversity, that we also recognize that we want to select going forward the best and the brightest and most qualified, and that there is no history at the federal bench of people making different decisions based on their economic position in life or their, uh, their distinctions at birth, whether it's color or gender. So I am looking forward to us, and, and, I, and I really believe the chairman has picked an appropriate subject for us to look at when we're preparing to expand the court. But I also believe that we're going to find that properly chosen, these justices and, and judges will in fact execute in a way that cannot be predicted based on any part of their, uh, uh, their, their birth rights, if you will, of citizenship, of color, or of gender. Lastly, I'd like to put one piece of levity into this. I, for one, would like to see, at some point, more diversity on the, the Supreme Court. It appears as though you must go to Harvard or Yale to be considered uh, in many cases. And as someone who graduated from an Ohio State University, 
I certainly would hope that we reach out and find justices that have gone beyond just a handful of Ivy League colleges. And with that, I appreciate the opportunity to attend this hearing and to participate, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman from California, and I'm now pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I will begin my, my remarks by quoting from the confirmation hearing of a current Supreme Court justice. When I get a case about discrimination, I have to think about people in my own family who suffered discrimination because of their ethnic background or because of religion or because of gender, the justice said. And I, do take that, and I do take that into account. This statement was a frank acknowledgement that our federal judges bring their life experiences with them to the bench and that those experiences inevitably inform their work. And it goes to the heart of why this hearing is so important. The justice also explained that I am who I am in the first place because of my parents, telling the Senate Judiciary Committee that my father was brought into this country as an infant, grew up in poverty, and could not find a job as a teacher because of the discriminatory hiring practices prevalent at the time. Our federal courts are made better by having justices whose family experiences with poverty, immigration, and discrimination were so powerful that they not only made that experience part of the record of their confirmation hearing, but they also declared that they had to take that experience into account when deciding cases. These words were spoken by now Justice Samuel Alito at his confirmation hearing in 2006. I think most Americans would agree with what Justice Alito said, and they would be glad to have judges who understand that their own and their colleagues' varied backgrounds, perspectives, and life experiences make our judiciary stronger. I also think most Americans, especially most young people, would take for granted the idea that our courts should reflect the incredible diversity uh, of our country. Unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to judicial diversity. There are ways in which the federal judiciary of 2021 looks uncomfortably similar to the federal judiciary of 1921, just a few years after J Justice Brandeis became a torrent of anti-Semitic opposition to becoming the first Jewish Supreme Court justice. Somehow, despite all our progress, today's federal judges remain, for instance, overwhelmingly male, white, former prosecutors or corporate lawyers who went to a handful of law schools, as Mr. Issa mentioned. There's only one female judge among the Eighth Circuit's 15 active members, and she is only the second woman ever to serve on that court. There have been no black judges on the Seventh Circuit at all, which encompasses Illinois, Wisconsin, and, and Indiana since 2018, after the first person of color ever to serve on that circuit retired. There's just one Hispanic judge on the 10th Circuit, which includes Colorado, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, Utah, and Wyoming. And there has never been a Native American judge on any court of appeals. We need to come to terms with why our federal courts remain so strikingly diverse, non-diverse in so many ways. I'm not just referring to characteristics like race, gender, ethnicity, religion, or disability. Why, for example, are there so few judges who are public defenders civil rights lawyers, plaintiff's attorneys, legal aid attorneys, or small business attorneys. Our, judicial, uh, our judiciary would be enriched if we had more judges with a broader range of legal experiences and education. We must also consider the consequences this lack of diversity has on the broader judicial system. For example, Americans are many times more likely to appear in bankruptcy court than in any other federal court, but bankruptcy judges are the least racially and ethnically diverse judges in the entire federal judiciary. And they're not even proper Article III judges. That is especially concerning because bankruptcy judges are appointed by a majority vote of the Court of Appeals judges in their circuit. As I just mentioned, they're not even uh, Article III judges. Since this is an area in which the federal judiciary can address this diversity problem without help from Congress or the president, I hope it will make it improving diversity among its bankruptcy judges a priority. Ultimately, we need to remind ourselves of what most Americans understand, that a diverse federal judiciary enhances public faith in the courts and improves the judicial process. I want to thank Mr. Johnson for holding this hearing. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about this important topic. I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman from New York, and I now recognize the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Mr. Ohio, chairman, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Mr. Chairman, the uh, ranking member will pass at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Congressman Issa. We will now begin with the introduction to panel one and uh, the Honorable Carlton W. Reeves is a district judge for the Southern District of New York, excuse me, Southern District of Mississippi. After law school, Judge Reeves clerked for the Honorable Reuben V. Anderson of the Mississippi Supreme Court. He subsequently worked as a staff attorney for the Supreme Court of Mississippi and in private practice. From 1995 to 2001, Judge Reeves served as chief of the civil division of the office of the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, excuse me, Mississippi. And in 2001, he opened his own firm, Piggott Reeves Johnson in Jackson, Mississippi. During this time, Judge Reeves served on the board of several civic organizations, including the ACLU of Mississippi, the Mississippi Center for Justice, and the Magnolia Bar Association. Judge Reeves earned his BA from Jackson State University and his JD from the University of Virginia. The Honorable and uh, welcome judge, uh, the Honorable Frank J. Bailey is a bankruptcy judge on the bankruptcy court for the District of Massachusetts. He was appointed in 2009 and served as chief judge from 2010 to 2015. Judge Bailey also sits on the bankruptcy appellate panel for the First Circuit. He has served, <coughs> excuse me, as the First Circuit governor and chair of the Education Committee for the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges. Before his appointment, Judge Bailey was a partner at a law firm where he served as the chairman of the litigation department. He has taught as an associate professor at Boston University, Suffolk University, and the New England School of Law. He earned his undergraduate degree at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and his JD from the Suffolk, Suffolk University Law School. Uh, welcome, Judge Bailey. The Honorable James C. Ho is a circuit judge for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Ho clerked for Judge Jerry Edwin Smith of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and then entered into private practice. He served in the Civil Rights Division of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. From 2003 to 2005, he was chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee under Senator John Cornyn. He then clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas from 2005 to 2006. And from 2008 to 2010, Judge Ho was the Solicitor General of Texas. Judge Ho earned his BA from Stanford University and his JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Welcome, Judge Ho. The Honorable Edward M. Chin is a district judge for the Northern District of California. After law school, Judge Chen clerked for Judge Charles Byron Renfrew of the Northern District of California and for Judge James R. Browning of the Ninth Circuit. After time working in private practice, Judge Chen worked as a staff attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union. He then served as a United States magistrate judge in the Northern District of California. Judge Chen earned his BA and his JD from the University of California at Berkeley. Now, before proceeding with testimony, I remind the witnesses that all of your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalties of perjury pursuant to 18 USC section 1001 which may result in the imposition of a fine or imprisonment of up to five years or both. Please note that your written testimony, your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. There is a timer in the WebEx view that should be visible on your screen that should help you stay within that time limit. 
For this panel, we will not have any questions after, wit after the witness testifies. Judge Reeves, you may now begin. To Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Isa, and members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to testify alongside my esteemed colleagues, Judge Chen, Judge Donald, Judge Bailey, and Judge Ho. Their brilliance is proof that diversity makes our justice system strong. Between their words and the testimony of renowned academics like Professor Stacy Hawkins and Maya Sin and attorney Peter Kirsenow, I am sure you'll have all the evidence you need to know that we must diversify our federal courts. As I prepared my comments, I thought about the only other time that I've had the honor and privilege of appearing before this august body nearly 11 years ago at my confirmation hearing. On that day, I was joined by Judge Mary McGill, Denise Casper, Edmund Chang, and Judge Leslie Kobayashi. The room looked like America, a country populated by per persons of various races, colors, sexes, genders, religions, and sexual orientations, a, rep a representation of the tapestry that has been woven to make our more perfect union. At the hearing, Senator Durbin asked me the following question. Can you talk to us about the importance of racial diversity on the federal bench in Mississippi, given your personal experience growing up in Mississippi and your knowledge of how far your state has come? My response in part was that judges serve several functions, role models to other lawyers, role models to students, role models to the people who come before the court. People need to see that they have a chance, that they too can one day come to the great hall of the Senate and be nominated by a president to be a judge. My answer to that question today would be the same, as I am reminded every day how others perceived my role and purpose through their telephone calls, text messages, emails, notes, conversations, and in-court reactions and statements. All I can add to this more remarkable panel is a simple plea. Go big, aim high, be bold, simply be committed to diversity in the third branch of our government. It is a time for boldness because our present trajectory risked a crisis of legitimacy. More than two thirds of federal judges appointed over the last four years were white men, a group that represents less than one third of all Americans. 30% of Americans in the Seventh Circuit are persons of color, but the Seventh Circuit doesn't have a single black jurist. The Fifth Circuit has an enormous Latino population, yet none of its judges are Latino. I'm reminded of the raw emotion that a friend and mentor, Geraldine Sumter from Charlotte, North Carolina, experienced 10 years ago when she stepped to the podium to argue in the Fourth Circuit and across from her for the first time in her nearly 30 years of practice was a panel of three African-American judges. At this moment, having such a panel is still an elusive dream in many of our circuit courts but especially piercing the 5th and 11th circuits, the home of so many of America's African-American citizens. I'm ashamed to say that my own court didn't have a single female Article III judge until three months ago. I appreciate our senators for fixing that 200-year-old mistake. These are countless and other comparisons reveal a disturbing fact. As our country becomes more diverse, our courts are becoming more homogenous. In the judicial oath of office, we promise to administer justice. An extreme imbalance on our courts is a threat to justice. If I've learned one thing in my years as a judge, it is this, diversity matters. When our courts are diverse, they better understand the complexity of the American experience embedded in every case that comes before them. When our courts are diverse, they reinforce public trust in our system of government. America contains multitudes, so must its courts. 
Riding the ship will take more than a return to past practices. While the Obama administration appointed female judges at an unprecedented rate, nearly 60% of all judicial appointees under the administration were men. And while recent decades have seen periodic efforts to spring racial, to bring racial and gender diversity to the bench, appointees have increasingly shared educational and professional backgrounds, former prosecutors, partners in national law firms, and graduates of our nation's top law schools are overrepresented on the bench. We also need insights from other public servants, those in the academy, those in small firms, and those who have represented the hopeless and dispossessed, the public defendants, the immigration lawyers, and the rural legal aid lawyers. If you go big, aim high, and be bold, you will shape not just the next generation of judges, you will encourage change in the entire ecosystem of the legal profession. As my friend Melissa Murray points out, in that ecosystem, district judges influence the hiring of their own clerks, magistrate judges, special masters, receivers, MDL steering committees, and the clerks of our courts and all those hired into that public offices. Circuit judges are responsible for their own clerks, bankruptcy judges, public defenders, and the clerks of their courts. Judges and the lawyers they appoint serve on commissions, councils, committees, and other bodies to make sure our judicial system fulfills its core missions. Your leadership on the courts will have a ripple effect through this power profession. The very fact that I'm here to, before you today is a testament to Brown versus Board of Education. After that decision was implemented in my Mississippi, I joined the first fully integrated class of Mississippi school children. For 12 years, we, for, we were fortunate to be in the same classroom with each other, developing lifelong friendships and receiving education that prepared us for the world. Judge, that is it. Yes, sir. It if you could uh, sum up now, you are past your five minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm so very sorry. That decision is bravery and is courage and is moral clarity. I hope you will be similarly courageous in shaping the next generations of this country. Diversity matters. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Reeves and Judge Bailey. You may begin. I uh, thank you. Uh, to uh, Chair Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and to members of the committee for inviting me uh, to testify this afternoon on this very important subject. I have uh, submitted uh, a more extensive statement, uh, but I'd like to focus on just five points. Uh, my first point is that perceptions of equal treatment may matter just as much as the reality of equal treatment when you're talking about court appearances. My view on this was formed by a personal experience. Uh, I was in court early in my judicial career and an unrepresented African-American man came to a hearing on a motion that, that, that he had to lose. There was, there was no chance of him winning it. Uh, the law wouldn't have allowed it. I patiently explained that to him because he was unrepresented, and I gave him the reasons. I explained to him that his motion was just premature, that he would later have a chance to, to, to give us his basis uh, and preserve his rights. And at the end of the hearing, he looked up at me, and he said something I hope no other judge ever has to hear, but I know we have. He said, a black man cannot get a fair hearing in this court. Well, that statement took my breath away. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I uh, maintained my judicial composure. I calmly asked him to tell me all the reasons why he felt that was the case. Uh, uh, I explained to him that he was wrong in that view, uh, and uh, he had little to say. Uh, and uh, later on, by the way, he won his motion. Uh, I left the bench, and later I thought, of course he feels that way. He walked into a courtroom and the judge is white. All of the courtroom staff were white. 
All of the court security that he encountered coming in and in the courtroom were also white. And if he, if he went to our uh, clerk's office, he'd see the photographs of our judges on the wall, and they were all white. And so I realized it's perceptions that matter. And of course, he felt that way. My second point, perceptions of equal treatment in my court, the bankruptcy court, matter enormously. First, as Chair Nadler pointed out earlier, most Americans that encounter a federal judge will encounter a federal bankruptcy judge. That's because of the numbers. Second, access to a so-called fresh start uh, through the bankruptcy system is preserved by the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. So that right is assured to all Americans. And my fear is that unless the court, the judges on the court and our staffs reflect the communities that we serve, it may be that people in those communities may not feel that that they are welcome in our courts. And so diversity on the court and in the court family is enormously important. My third point, diversity on the bench, on the bankruptcy bench starts with diversity on the Article Three bench. Uh, again, Chairman Nadler saw this coming uh, when he said that, uh, and I am the only Article One judge who is testifying today, bankruptcy judges are appointed by circuit judges. Uh, circuit judges, uh, uh, where there are diverse circuit judges who are Article Three, making the decision on who, who gets the appointment to, to serve as a bankruptcy judge, more diverse lawyers will feel comfortable applying. My fourth point, virtually all of my colleagues um, on the on the bankruptcy bench agree with with me uh, that a diverse ba bankruptcy bench is essential to equity and fairness and inclusion in our country. I know that because I am serving as the president of the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges, a 100-year-old organization that almost all of our judges and retired judges are members of, and because my fellow judges work tirelessly on diversity initiatives every day to increase the participation of diverse individuals in our bankruptcy system. For example, and I'll give one, one of many that I could give, we have the Blackshear Fellowship Program uh, that we started some years ago that offers a, a, a diverse uh, offers diverse lawyers a scholarship to attend our annual conference. That brings them into contact with 1,500 bankruptcy professionals. Has that initiative worked? Well, you could ask Judge Charles Walker from Nashville. You could ask Judge Tyara Patton of Youngstown, Ohio. They were both Blackshear Fellows. They're both now serving on our bench. It worked. My, my fifth and final point is that the need to address diversity on our bench is not only critical, it may be urgent. The bankruptcy bench is the least diverse federal bench by far. In its last report on numbers uh, in 2019, the uh, AO's Fair Employment Practices Office reported that our bench, the bankruptcy bench, was under 3% African-American. 2% Hispanic, 2% Asian American, and there were no Native American or Pacific Islander uh, judges on our bench. In conclusion, bankruptcy judges deliver bad news to people uh, every day. Sometimes it's that you're going to lose your home. Other times it's you're not going to collect on that claim that you were counting on. So perceptions of fairness and equity matter enormously on the bankruptcy bench. So thank you so much, uh, Chairman uh, Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the subcommittee for taking the time to have these very important hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Bailey. Uh, we will now hear from Judge Ho. Judge Ho, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Nadler, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Members Jordan and Isa, thank you for inviting me to testify. I am honored to join my distinguished colleagues from the judiciary. My remarks today are akin to what we judges sometimes call concurring in the judgment. We uh, agree on certain core principles, but I would like to offer my own reasoning. 
Equality of opportunity is fundamental to who we are and to who we aspire to be as a nation. And to my mind, that means two things. It means that we must do everything we can to ensure that everyone truly has the opportunity to succeed. And it means we must never bend the rules to favor anyone. Dr. King had it right. Choose people based on who they are, not what they look like. Let me begin by explaining how I began. Uh, I came to America from Taiwan uh, at a very young age. So, you know, most kids grow up learning English from their parents. I grew up learning English from a bunch of puppets from a place called Sesame Street. My classmates brought a kid's lunchbox to school. I brought a bento box to school. My food seemed normal to me, but it smelled funny to my classmates, or so they would tell me. And I remember racial slurs and jokes on the playground and on the football field. But I also learned that if you work hard and prove yourself, you can find your place in America. Equality of opportunity is not something to be passive about. It's something we should be passionate about. We must make sure that everyone has the opportunity to learn and to succeed so that win, lose, or draw, at least you got a chance, no matter who you are. This is not just a talking point to me. It's why I was honored to serve as co-chair of the Judiciary Committee of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. It's why I love talking to young lawyers and law students of every race and ideological stripe. It's why I always say that if anyone is willing to forego other opportunities in their careers in order to enter public service, call me. I'll take them to lunch and share what I know. But here's the kicker. Once everyone has had full and fair opportunity to be considered, you pick on the merits. Both the Constitution and the Civil Rights Act make clear that it is wrong to hire people based on race. That's the law for a wide range of jobs. But it would be especially wrong, I would submit, to select judges based on race. It is true, I am the only Asian American on my court. I'm also the only immigrant on my court. But I would never suggest that a wise Asian would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white judge. That would be antithetical to our legal system and poisonous to civil society. No one should ever assume that I'm more likely to favor Asians or immigrants or anyone else, or that my colleagues are less likely to. Everyone should lose or win based on the law, period. That's why Lady Justice wears a blindfold. That's why judges wear black robes. And I don't say this because I think race is no longer an issue in our country. I've received racist hate mail and racially disparaging remarks because of positions I've taken in my legal career. I've been treated differently because of the race of the person I'm married to. And I also remember back in high school, my college admissions advisor telling me that my grades, SAT scores, and activities were all strong enough to get me into my top choice of schools if I wasn't Asian. Now, I'm not saying any of this here to complain. Whatever negative experiences I've had, they pale in comparison to the many blessings I've had living in this great country. I was not born an American, but I thank God every day that I will die an American. My point is just that I don't come to my views because I think racism is behind us. Rather, I come to my views precisely because racism is not behind us. Because the last thing we should do is divide people by race. The last thing we should do is to suggest that the racists are right. We don't achieve equality of opportunity by denying it to anyone. We achieve it by securing it for everyone. So make no mistake, it would be profoundly offensive and un-American to tell the world that you're restricting a judgeship to members of only one race. It's offensive to people of other races, and it's offensive to people of that race, because you're suggesting that the only way they'll get the job is if you rig the rules in their favor. As a judge, I have the profound honor of presiding over a naturalization ceremony every year. Uh, I do this to celebrate my own naturalization now 39 years ago. People from all around the world come together in one room for one purpose, to become an American. And it reminds me that what binds our nation is not a common race 
or religion or philosophical point of view. What unites us is not a common past, but a common hope for the future, a shared love of freedom and a mutual commitment to the Constitution and to the principle of equality of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Ho. Judge, Chan, Judge Chen, you may begin. And Judge Chen, you may need to unmute. Apologize for that. I hope that doesn't count against my time. Um, no, we will start your time now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa and Isa, and members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to have the opportunity to address you today on this, this very important topic. Uh, I would like to highlight three points from my more extensive written submission. Diversity in, in the judiciary is valuable for three reasons. One, it promotes trust and confidence of the public. Two, it enhances interrelationships within the, within the bench. And three, it improves the quality of decision-making. Public trust. To put the chairman's remarks about the importance of public trust in the courts, I'd like to tell you a simple story. My colleague, Judge Edward Davila, sits in San Jose and presides over a diverse docket. He is the first Latinx judge to sit on our court in 20 years. In a case involving a limited English-speaking Latino lit litigant, Judge Davila discussed some procedural matters and then asked the litigant if he had any questions. Appearing nervous, the litigant looked at Judge Davila and asked, will you be my judge? Those simple words, freighted with anxiety, bespoke the sense of intimidation and alienation too often felt by members of underserved communities. Judge in Judge Davila, that litigant found an island of hope in a sea of isolation, hope that he would at least be heard and understood. This seemingly small, insignificant courtroom moment underscores a larger point, that the bench that is reflective of the community it serves can be instrumental in securing the trust and confidence of the public. A word about interpersonal relationships on the bench. A diverse bench affords a unique and personal opportunity for judges to learn from each other, thereby enriching interpersonal relationships. That point was eloquently made by Justice O'Connor in her tribute in 1992 to Justice Thurgood Marshall. She recounted Justice Marshall's fondness of sharing personal stories with other justices in conference in order to emphasize legal points, including stories about the Ku Klux Klan violence, jury bias, defending an innocent African-American wrongly convicted of rape and sentenced to death. Judge O'Connor spoke about the impact those stories had on her own understanding of the issues confronting the court. As she put it, no one could help but be moved by Justice Thurgood Marshall's spirit. Occasionally at conference meetings, I still catch myself looking expectantly for his raised brow and his twink twinkling eye, hoping to hear just one more story that would perhaps change the way I see the world. As a local example, former chief judge of our district, Marilyn Hall Patel, speaks of her experience as the first, and for many years only, woman on our bench. She describes how she would hear laughter and loud chatter in the judge's lunchroom, which came to a sudden halt when the sounds of her approaching heels reached her male colleagues. One day, a raucous rally was heard outside the courthouse. One of her colleagues asked, what's going on? Judge Patel explained it was a rally for International Women's Day. Her colleague then jabbed, well, maybe they should have an International Men's Day, to which she replied, that's the other 364 days of the year. Judge Patel stood her ground and over time moved the needle. And finally, about decision-making. Decision-making, diversity on the bench enhances the quality of decision-making. Take, for instance, credibility determinations. A witness's testimony may seem more credible if it is consistent with the judge's experience, and conversely, less credible if it remains outside that judge's experience. The first African-American chief judge of our court, Felton Henderson, recalled an instance in which a white colleague was presiding over a racial harassment trial. That judge noted that the plaintiff 
was generally credible. However, the judge still found it hard to believe the plaintiff's testimony about racist graffiti found on a locker and a drawing of a hangman's noose around a baboon left on his desk. While his colleague found that testimony implausible, Judge Henderson recounted to him how members of his own family had experienced the very same kind of harassment described by the plaintiff, and that he found nothing inherently implausible about that testimony. Diversity also ensures a fuller discussion of legal analysis. Take, for instance, the case of Redding versus Safford Unified School District, which involved the question whether a strip search of a middle school female student suspected of drugs violated the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court had to determine whether the search was excessively intrusive and thus unreasonable. During oral argument, one male justice remarked how it wasn't unusual when he was 12 to take off his clothes when he had to change for gym. In a later interview, Justice Ginsburg explained she needed to facilitate her fellow justices understanding of what a strip search might mean to a teenage girl. As she put it, they have never been a 13 year old girl. It's a very sensitive age for a girl and I don't think my colleagues, at least some of them quite understood. The court ultimately found the search unconstitutional. As another example, Virginia versus Black, where the court had to address the constitutionality of the law making it a crime to burn a cross. According to press accounts, the initial questioning by the court indicated that members of the court seemed inclined to strike the law down as violative of the, of the First Amendment until Justice Clarence Thomas spoke. Recounting the reign of terror visited upon black communities by the Ku Klux Klan, Justice Thomas said that a burning cross is unlike any symbol in our society and had no purpose other than to cause fear and to terrorize the population. According to press accounts, his fellow justices were wrapped and the tenor of the argument turned. The court went on to uphold the statute, making it illegal to burn a cross with the intent to intimidate others. In 1943 and 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the imposition of race-based curfews and internment of 120,000 Japanese Americans in Hirabayashi and Korematsu. And justifying why Japanese Americans could be singled out for mass treatment, whereas Americans of German and Italian descent were not, the court opined that Japanese Americans were more prone to disloyalty and presented a military risk. The court based its assumption on its observation that the Japanese have, quote, intensified their solidarity and have in large measure prevented their assimilation as an integral part of the white population. I asked the question, what if there had been a Japanese American justice on the court? That justice would have likely have challenged the false assumption made by his fellow justices reminding them that two thirds of those who were interned were full United States citizens, most by birthright, and that therefore, before they were ripped from their homes by the internment order, Japanese Americans were inextricably integrated into the economy. That justice might have related how they had a nephew who had just been elected class president of an integrated high school and described how Japanese American children were active in the YMCA, and the Boy Scouts, that many excelled in all American sports like basketball, tennis, bowling, and golf, and followed baseball as closely as any other American. And Judge Ho, uh, you are now beyond your five minutes. If you would uh, sum up, we'd greatly appreciate it. Okay, I'll just, I'll just do 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that yes, just would have told his colleagues about their son, nephew or brother who enlisted in the army along with thousands of other Japanese Americans to join the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most decorated unit for its size in U.S. military history, a regiment that ironically was among the first to liberate the concentration camp at Dachau. So in closing, I feel there is a cost when voices are missing from the room. That cost is not theoretical. It is real. Diversity makes for a better judiciary, and that in turn helps fulfill our promise of justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Judge Chen. And that concludes the first panel of today's hearing. And I'd like to thank the witnesses for their participation and for their testimony. Thank you very much. And at this time, we will transition to the second panel of witnesses. And we'll give that a just a couple of seconds.
All right, staff, are we ready? Okay, I have been given the uh, okay to begin now with our second panel. Uh, to introduce our first uh, witness, I will turn to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, uh, for his introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my honor to introduce one of the most distinguished jurists in the United States of America the Honorable Judge Bernice Donald. Judge Donald was born just south of Memphis in South Haven, Mississippi. She went to Memphis State University for undergraduate school and also for law school. She became an attorney and started out with legal services. And when she was with legal services, she appeared before me in 1980 when I had a brief interim general sessions courtship. Uh, fortunately, we both left those positions. She became a public defender after she was in, uh, a legal services attorney. And eventually she was a uh, general sessions judge herself. And then she became a United States bankruptcy judge about six years or seven years. And then through president Clinton's appointment, uh, she became a federal district court judge, uh, recommended by my predecessor, Harold Ford senior. Uh, she served about 16 years in Memphis as an outstanding uh, member of our local bench in the Western District of Tennessee, and then was elevated to the Sixth Circuit about 10 years ago by President Barack Obama. She's been an outstanding judge and shows how opportunities given can be shown to make justice better, to serve with distinction, and to be a very uh, great representative and honorable representative of the city of Memphis, Judge Bernice Donald. Thank you, Congressman Cohen, and welcome, Judge Donald. Uh, next, I will introduce Maya Sin, who is a professor of public policy at John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Her research covers law, political economy, race and ethnic politics, and statistical methods. Professor Sin currently serves as the director of the Harvard Multidisciplinary Program in Inequality and Social Policy. She is also an affiliate for the Institute for Quantitative Social Science, the Taltman Center for State and Local Government, and the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. She served as JD excuse me, she earned her JD from Stanford Law School and a PhD in political science from Harvard. She was also a clerk for Judge Ron Gilman of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Welcome, Professor Sin. Peter N. Personov, or Personnel, I'm sorry, is a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He was appointed in 2001 and is currently serving his fourth term and is the longest serving member of the commission. Mr. Kersenow is also a partner in the Cleveland office of the law firm Banesh, Freelander, Copland, and Aronoff and works within its labor and employment practice group. Previously, he served as a member of the National Labor Relations Board from 2006 to 2008, and he earned his BA from Cornell University and his JD from Cleveland State University. Welcome, Commissioner Kersenow. Stacy Hawkins is a professor of law at Rutgers Law School. She teaches classes on constitutional law, employment law, and diversity and the law and our research focuses on the intersection of law and diversity. Prior to teaching, Professor Hawkins spent over a decade in private practice advising clients in both the public and private sector on the development and implementation of legal defensible diversity policies and programs. Professor Hawkins earned her BA from the University of Virginia and her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Welcome, Professor Hawkins. Before proceeding with your testimony, I, remain, I remind everyone that all of your written uh, and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to 18 U.S.C. Section 
1001. Please note that your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. And accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. There is a timer in the WebEx view that should be visible on your screen. And uh, that should help you uh, stay within your uh, time limit. So uh, Judge Donald, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, House Judiciary Chair Nadler, and my Congressman Steve Cohen. Um, I am Judge Bernice B. Donald, a member of the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Uh, our circuit covers Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Diversity in every sense of the word is critical to the proper functioning of a federal court. A one-dimensional court cannot fully grasp the many dimensions of American life. Federal courts should be diverse as the communities that they serve. Justice uh, Kagan put it this way, people look at an institution and they see, pe see people who are like them, who share their experiences, who imagine, uh, who, who they imagine rather, share their values. In order to truly deliver justice, we're tasked with administering. We must not only understand the arguments being made by the parties, but also the perspectives through which those arguments are made. It is difficult to describe in five minutes all of the benefits that a diverse federal bench confers, but there are at least two reasons why maintaining diversity in the federal courts is essential. First, a diverse bench has a diversity of viewpoints and lived experiences that inform what justice looked like in cases. Second, a diverse bench reinforces the legitimacy of our judicial institutions and promotes respect for the rule of law. First, diversity of viewpoint. For every case, the law should govern always without question, but there is no escaping the truth that we are all shaped by our lived experiences. And those lived experiences have round out the law, the black letter law that we all learn. This goes beyond the usual categories of identity, race, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender, uh, gender expression, religion, and national origin. It means the collection of every event, fortune, and misfortune that we may have embraced throughout our lives. As my friend, uh, U.S. District Court Judge Ed Chan, whom you heard from recently wrote, although a judge's duty is to recognize those predilections and control them, it is simply unrealistic to pretend that life experiences do not affect one's perceptions in the process of judging. A judge who grows up, for example, on a farm in America's heartland will have a different perspective on a rural agricultural program than a judge who spends his or her life in New York City. A judge who has a hearing disability would have a different perspective on the Americans with Disabilities Act than a judge who does not, to be clear, we as judges will always follow the law, but justice is often about more than simply the black letter law. Justice is informed by our perspectives and diversity mean, does not mean that individual decisions are driven by our life experiences. Rather, they add different angles from which to look uh, at an issue or a question. If our judiciary were homogenous in thought and perspectives, Justice Harlan, who penned the dissent uh, in the, the Plessy case, which 50 years later became the majority, um, would not have perhaps had that perspective. Uh, Judge Wallace Tashima of the Ninth Circuit, reflecting on his own experience in the Japanese internment uh, camp, once remarked, because we are all creatures of our past, I have no doubt that my life experiences, including the evacuation and internment, have shaped the way I view my job as a federal judge and the skepticism that I sometimes bring to the representations and motives uh, of other branches of government. As judges, our role is not to shed those experiences, but to embrace and apply them. Second, diversity adds confidence in our institutions of law. And you heard that from Judge Frank Bailey. A non-diverse bench may be viewed as a biased bench, 
A vital aspect of eliminating that perception is ensuring that the federal bench looks like the people that it serves. When cases are decided by judges who do not respect or understand the needs of particular communities, especially communities of color or socioeconomically depressed communities, members of those communities are less likely to trust the, the decisions that are rendered by those judges. And that is borne out by a 60 year old study done by an organization known as the National Conference of Christians and Jews. I know that my time uh, is about out, but let me say this. The value of diversity is not just in presence alone. Uh, behind those closed doors, uh, when we as, as circuit judges conference, perspectives and lived experiences matters. And so there's a rich benefit that comes to that, comes from that. I have a, a, a story that is just the opposite of the one just uh, Judge Bailey told, which I hope to have share, have an opportunity to share with you during the, uh, the question and answer period. But as I close, a diverse bench is increasingly critical to our concept of justice. At a certain point, a federal judiciary that looks nothing like the makeup of the rest of the country will lose the people's confidence. On the other hand, a federal bench that looks like our more perfect union will move us closer to delivering a more perfect justice. Thank you. Thank you, Judge uh, Donald. And next we will hear from Professor Sin. Professor Sin, you may begin. Um, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you today. Uh, judicial diversity is an important topic. Our nation's courts are out of step with our country's demographics and in other ways fail to reflect the rich variety of educational and professional experiences that our legal profession has to offer. And there is evidence, as many have noted, that greater diversity would strengthen the public's trust in the judiciary. So let me illustrate some of this. So to give you one example, according to the US Census, about 19% of all Americans identify as Hispanic, but only about 6% of our Court of Appeals judges and 10% of our district judges identify as Hispanic. 1.3% of Americans are Native American, but only two, not 2%, two of our judges out of about 800 Court of Appeals or district judges are Native American, and both actually were pretty recently appointed. And of course, half of Americans are women and about 40% of lawyers are women, yet women comprise only about a third of federal judges. Now, I, I, I really do believe that diversity extends to a variety of life experiences, but we could also be doing better in this regard. So for example, close to one in six Court of Appeals judges attended just one law school, and that was Harvard Law School, and one in four attended one of two law schools, Harvard or Yale Law Schools. Um, even more staggering, a whopping two out of three Court of Appeals judges attended one of the highly elite top 14 law schools, the most elite of the nation's law schools. Now, this is the effect of largely shutting out exceptional candidates from law schools considered less elite and therefore effectively penalizes those who, for whatever reason, um, cho choose to attend a less expensive school or actually who don't want to attend a law school clustered in a handful of cities. Um, the lack of diversity extends also to professional experiences, as others have noted. So another large share of our nation's judges, so about one in three Court of Appeals judges at least, um, have some sort of prosecutorial experience, but only one in 45, so about 2%, list equivalent public defender experience. Um, another example I like here is close to one in three Court of Appeals judges are professors of some sort, and I like professors very much. Some of my best friends are professors but this is in no way reflective of the US population or even reflective of graduates of elite law programs. Um, so why are these discrepancies important? So I, I will turn again and again to the research here. So we have a lot of peer review studies showing that judges of different backgrounds decide cases in different ways. Um, so for example, a number of studies have shown that black and white judges often differ in terms of criminal sentencing with white judges being harsher than black judges against black defendants. Other studies have shown that white judges are less likely to vote in favor of claimants in voting rights cases or in affirmative action cases, although this is not always the case. Um, and that some of these differences attenuate when white and black judges sit together, which is an interesting finding. Um, we have similar evidence on gender. Male judges are more likely to side against plaintiffs in sexual discrimination cases, though not always. But differences also tend to attenuate when women sit alongside men. And there are actually dozens of peer-reviewed studies on these points. 
Um, there's also lots of evidence, uh, quantitative, scientific, and peer-reviewed journals, um, some of it from outside the courts, that diversity broadly supports healthy group decision-making leading to the vigorous discussion of a variety of perspectives and something that is absolutely essential for something like recordive appeals. So one of the most relevant studies on this point showed that white decision makers engage more deeply in factual inquiry, they make fewer factual errors, and they are more amenable to the discussion of racism when they are in mixed race groups as opposed to all white groups. And we would expect similar things to happen in our federal courts of appeals and in our federal district courts. Um, I want to conclude by pointing out what several studies have shown, which is that more diverse institutions do tend to garner stronger and more robust public support. And for the courts, which as we now have no enforcement power, having strong public trust is incredibly important. And here the evidence does suggest that many people would have stronger beliefs in the institutional legitimacy of the courts with greater diversity. So again, thank you for your time and I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you, Professor Sin and uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Kirsten now. Uh, you may now begin. He's muted. Commissioner Kersenau, uh, if you will unmute yourself. Apologies, I thought it was unmuted. Okay. Thank you, Chairman okay. Johnson, Ranking Member Ison, members of the committee. Um, I'm a partner in the Labor Employment Practice Group of Benish Freelander and a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. I'm appearing in my personal capacity. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights was established pursuant to the Civil Rights Act of 1957 to, among other things, investigate denials of equal protection on the basis of race and other protected characteristics. Today's hearing is about the importance of diversity in the federal judiciary. It's a conclusory statement, though it's not one that I necessarily disagree with. But as a matter of preliminary inquiry, there may have been a culpable argument that it would be salutary to increase the number of, say, black state court judges in 1957 when the commission was created and when racial discrimination was both legal and rampant. It's at least defensible that the presence of, say, black judges might have assured litigants that their matters would be fairly and impartially adjudicated. But even then, any inclination towards expanding judicial diversity should always have been consistent with the overriding principle of non-discrimination. Today, some urge that we should diversify the federal judiciary in order to improve the, quote, legitimacy of the courts among the public. Taken to its logical conclusion, however, this might actually undermine public confidence in the judiciary. It suggests whether or subtly or overtly, that unless one appears before a judge who shares your pigmentation or ethnic background, you cannot trust that your case will be fairly adjudicated. Perpetuating that notion itself derogates public faith in the judicial system. Indeed, just yesterday, two U.S. senators announced that they will not vote to confirm any diverse, non-diverse nominees. But as Chief Justice John Roberts stated in Currents Involved versus Seattle Schools, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. I'm aware of the studies that note that there is differences in decision making based on race and sex. I'm unaware, however, of any credible studies that show that a more diverse judiciary would yield, quote, better decisions. It's unclear how one would even measure something like that. One could compare rates of reversals, I suppose, but that won't particularly be helpful. For example, according to the Center for American Progress, the Ninth Circuit is the most reversed appellate circuit, but has neither the greatest disparity between percentages of white judges compared to the general population in the circuit, nor the smallest disparity. It also seems somewhat unlikely that diversifying the federal judiciary would lead to appreciably different outcomes, even if one believes the judge's decisions may be influenced by explicit or implicit bias. 
the decisions of federal appellate judges in particular tend to pertain to fairly technical issues. For example, do white judges and black judges have different interpretations of standing requirements? Section 1 of the Sherman Act, Section 8B3 of the National Labor Relations Act. There is a possibility that white judges and black judges could, on average, come to different decisions in some cases. That may not be because of their race, but perhaps because black judges may be more likely to have been appointed by Democrats or to have, say, progressive political views. Perhaps some black judges are more disposed toward black plaintiffs in discrimination cases, but they might be more likely to be inclined toward any plaintiffs in discrimination cases. Other, in other words, the judge's race is simply an imperfect proxy for ideology. Race may also be an imperfect proxy for class. Well-intended but misguided policies have contributed to the dearth of diverse judges in another way. The academic achievement gap between Black and Hispanic students on the one hand and white and Asian students on the other is profound. This gap begins early in students' academic careers, and it's because of this gap that universities and law schools give significant admissions preferences to Black and Hispanic students. Those preferences actually end up harming many of the supposed beneficiaries who are then mismatched with respect to their peers. Some struggle in law school, which then makes it more difficult for them to obtain the clerkships, law review memberships, other prestigious positions in law firms and government that are often predicates to becoming a federal judge. Increasing the diversity of the federal bench should not override equal treatment under the law, nor should it trump proficiency and excellence. Casting a wide net in the application process to ensure as many diverse candidates as possible are vetted is consistent with the imperative of non-discrimination while increasing the probability of selecting more diverse candidates. Lady Justice is blindfolded the administration of justice should be colorblind. No race, ethnicity, or sex has a lock on judicial excellence. It's respectfully submitted that members of the federal judiciary should be selected on reliable indices of legal acumen, judicial temperament, and the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank, thank you, you, Mr. Kirsten, now. Uh, Last but not least, we will hear from Professor Hawkins. Professor Hawkins, you may now begin. Thank you so much to Chairman Nadler, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Issa, and the other distinguished members of this subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. As has been said, I am a professor of law at Rutgers Law School. And after more than a decade in private practice, I have spent the last decade um, at Rutgers, um, writing and teaching about the intersection of law and diversity. I've authored numerous articles on the subject and several about judicial diversity specifically. So I would like to say that I am delighted that the House is taking up this issue and I am honored to offer this testimony here today. I want to begin with some data about the diversity or lack thereof on the federal bench. From 1789 until 1960, there were only two white women and another two men of color appointed to the federal bench. Perhaps not surprisingly to anyone here, the civil rights era seemed to mark a key turning point. When we began to acknowledge, albeit tacitly, that the judiciary must begin to reflect the diversity of our citizens in order to be viewed as legitimate. Then in 1977, this acknowledgement was made explicit by President Jimmy Carter who announced his commitment to diversifying the federal bench. Carter went on to appoint more than twice the number of women and minority judges to the bench than had been appointed during the uh, previous four administrations combined. It was a watershed moment. In 1981, Ronald Reagan broke another historic barrier when he appointed Sandra Day O'Connor as the first female justice to the Supreme Court. Then following Reagan, each of the next four successive presidents crossed both parties, built on their political predecessors' progress in diversifying the federal bench. However, after nearly three decades, that trend receded for the first time during Donald Trump's presidency. Perhaps most notably, none of the 54 circuit court judges appointed by Trump were black, despite representing the largest share of sitting minority judges on the bench. And only one was Hispanic 
the second largest minority group among sitting judges. This reversal of modern presidential practice is troubling for two reasons. First, as many have said, diverse judges secure the trust necessary to enhance judicial legitimacy. And second, diverse judges ensure judicial accountability to our increasingly diverse nation. Opinion polls measuring public trust in our federal government reveal that while the judiciary remains the most well-regarded of the three branches, this trust is not equally distributed. One study found that only a quarter of white respondents, but more than three quarters of black respondents, believe the justice system treats blacks unfairly. This concern for fairness threatens the effective functioning of our judiciary, which relies on people's trust in order to legitimize the rule of law. Now, many people point to increases in politically polarized decision making as the source of citizens eroding trust in the judicial branch. Research, however, instead demonstrates that it is the appearance of fairness in the judicial process itself, more than substantive outcomes, that fosters trust in our judicial system. And one way to promote this sense of fairness is to ensure that judicial decision makers reflect the diverse communities they serve. As one judge observed about the judicial process, quote, you want for this thing to not only be fair, but to look fair, unquote. Research shows that when judicial decision makers are diverse, not only do they engender trust in the judicial process, they also enhance accountability to minority communities, particularly on issues of high racial salience, as been mentioned in cases like voting rights or discrimination. One study found that plaintiffs in racial harassment cases had higher success rates when their cases were decided by a black judge than when their case was decided by either a white or a Hispanic judge. And contrary to what has been stated, these findings held even after controlling for the judge's political affiliation. The last point that I wanna make before concluding my remarks is that the judiciary lacking in diversity is inconsistent with our ideals of representative democracy. And more importantly, perhaps today, it's increasingly out of step with broad public support for a government more represented of our diverse nation. Diversity on the federal bench is not just about curing a crisis of judicial legitimacy. It is also about preserving the promise of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. You're muted, muted, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Hawkins, thank you for your testimony. We'll now re proceed under the five minute rule. And uh, I will begin by recognizing myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Judge Donald, you've often held the title of the first, the first black woman to serve on the Sixth Circuit the first black woman district judge for the Western District of Tennessee. What impact do you think your many firsts have, what impact have those first had on the public that your courts have served, both on the bench and off the bench? Thank you, Chairman Johnson. Uh, I have been privileged in my community to um, be able to serve in those important positions. And for me, what has happened uh, by that, uh, the, the honor of being a first is I've had an opportunity to demonstrate that people who look like me in gender and race can do uh, an effective job, can uphold the law, can apply themselves, and can meet all of the requisite, requisite qualifications that compete with others who sit in those positions. But more than that, uh, I think it has served to inspire others who may not have uh, believed that they could do this to see that someone like them uh, can achieve those positions and do that job. I think one of the things that's been said and bears some truth, uh, Professor uh, Hawkins talked about the, the federal courts. For the first 139 years of the court's existence, the court was completely white and male. People of color did not all of a sudden begin to be qualified in 1967 when Justice Thurgood Marshall was appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, the same as women did not uh, just suddenly become uh, qualified when um, 
uh, Justice, pardon me, Judge Florence Allen or Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, were appointed, nor did uh, uh, Latinx people certainly become, uh, all of a sudden become magically qualified with the um, appointment of Justice O'Connor. But, but I think those who are in authority have to see and understand that we are a country that is rich in diversity, rich in talent, and rich in skill. And I want to take this opportunity to say, no one on the, these panels, I believe, are arguing that people ought to be uh, appointed to positions or have an opportunity to, to achieve just because of their gender or their, their appearance. But we're saying that all people who are, are talented have something to contribute. And if they have an opportunity and they have something to contribute, that they should be able to compete without the, the barrier of, um, of race or gender or socioeconomic status. And Thank in you, those David. positions of first, that's what I think I've been able to demonstrate. Thank you, Judge Donald. Uh, Professor Hawkins, one recurring theme we've heard is that when the judicial branch, when the judicial bench is diverse, judicial decision making is better. What does it mean for decision making to be better in this context? Chairman Johnson, I certainly did not represent that it's better, but it is different and it is improved and it is improved along a number of dimensions. Um, first, as many people have said, um, diverse people have different experiences and those experiences shape our perspectives on various issues. I think that all of the anecdotes that have been shared today about how people from different walks of life have contributed their experiences and their different perspectives to their decision making from the bench is proof of that benefit. Um, the second is that there is a deliberative benefit so that particularly on appellate panels, but also simply in the interactions that uh, district court judges have with their colleagues um, will improve their ability to deliberate around issues when they're exposed to different points of view. So it does improve decision making, both because people with different experiences bring different things to bear and it enhances deliberation. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sin, your testimony describes diversity as leading to quote, healthy decision makings. Can you, ex can you explain why research suggests that this is the case? Yeah, so, well, we have a couple of strands of research that really form that view. So first of all, we have research from outside the court. So looking at business organizations, corporate leaderships, corporate boards, other kinds of governmental decision making units. And all of those point to the direction that more diverse groups of people Will, will, as was just said, discuss, uncover, leave no stone unturned in terms of you know, the different viewpoints informing the decision making. So there is the evidence that a more diverse group decision making um, is more robust and takes into account different positions. And then we also have evidence um, from within the courts that panels, like judicial panels on the Court of Appeals, that have different composition in, in, in terms of race and gender actually do reach different kinds of decisions as opposed to panels that are more homogenous, for example, all white or all male panels. Um, and so we have evidence from within the courts that actually really uh, engages the, the view that yeah. more uh, diversity actually you know, strengthens the group decision-making and, and kind of contributes to, to healthy decision-making. Thank you. My time has expired. We will next have five minutes of questions from the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm going to start off by asking a couple of questions of Mr. Kersenow. Um, you, uh, you've been part of a, uh, a group, a commission that helps select federal judges in Ohio. Is that correct? That's correct. And when you're looking at the applications, uh, do some of those prejudices, regardless of which president uh, and, and what Senate, do some of those prejudices of Ivy League schools, uh, of party uh, based on who's, who's suggesting that individual and experience based on, uh, you know, sort of that stereotype of a prosecutor and a certain uh, resume is more likely to get you confirmed. Are all of those preloaded into the applicants? Well, um, I should say that I'm restricted from discussing these things because of our bylaws. They're all, all of our deliberations are confidential, but there sure, are I'm only talking, I'm only talking about the broad nature yeah. of the applicants. The, the generally speaking, you, there are a host of factors that are employed 
And there are a host of factors that are pertinent to whether or not somebody is qualified or deemed to be qualified to at least be presented for nomination to the federal judiciary. Um, all, among those are, you know, academic qualifications, social work, um, time served on the bench, experience as possibly a clerk, um, maybe some type of other um, experience with respect to governmental positions. One thing that we almost all keep in mind is I don't think anybody who's testified thus far today, at least when I've heard it, is opposed to a diverse federal judiciary. I don't think that's the case. The question is, how do you get there consistent with 1964 Civil Rights Act, 14th Amendment, everything, right? Because we're talking about a compelling state interest. In other words, if you're making a decision, even a balancing decision, based on race, you must be serving a compelling state interest. That's a high bar. It can't be something minor. It's usually been reserved to matters of national security, something of extreme importance. So all the sure, factors- sure. I, I don't wanna interrupt you unfairly, but the, the question that I wanted to get to is, isn't, isn't there, from your experience, a bit of a bias toward Ivy League schools, toward people who had the opportunity to do more extracurricular activity? Uh, in, in other words, socioeconomic advantage does play a part in whether or not you're likely to be able to come to the federal bench simply because the nature of being qualified is a combination of intelligence and drive and opportunity and that third one uh, often makes a difference on whether you you can go to harvard or you have to go to the school that you can afford yeah um i will say that there's clearly a real disparity in terms of where the the um, educational um, kind of template skews. And that is, it, it is, as other people have testified, skewed toward the Ivy League, just dramatically so. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the Ivy League is better, that Harvard or Yale are better, but that happens to be the case. And I think that's true throughout the, um, uh, the districts and throughout the circuits. The, along that same line, uh, your uh and I'll get off of your selection process, but the, uh, the inherent uh, question is, if you have a single judge, we'll leave the Supreme Court and appellate judges, if you have a single judge sitting on the bench, do you believe, as some of the other witnesses said, that you can predict how they're going to behave based on their gender or race? I wish. I mean, I've only been doing this for 42 years. Maybe somebody has a different perspective, but, and I've been before, several judges a number of times, and even though I've been in front of them a number of times, sometimes spanning decades, very often I'm surprised, but the least able, and I, I'm, I'm not disputing any of the studies, but the least uh, reliable indice for me in, or, in order to predict which way a judge is gonna go. If I'm telling a client when I'm in a trial, I think we're gonna go this way if it's a bench trial, it really has to do with perceived ideology. That's the one. It has nothing to do with race, sex, age, any of those things. If you can get a pretty good handle on what is the ideology of this particular judge, and not that ideology is controlling. I'm saying that it is clearly a greater demarcation factor than the others in my experience. Now, again, that's Let me ask one question. And one closing question. Uh, are we potentially uh, conflating or confusing in some parts of our discussion today, the diversity that is essential uh, in, a, in a judge, perhaps what we're really looking at is what you did as a, do as a trial lawyer when you're selecting a jury and you have some skill capability of predicting a better potential outcome based on one or all 12 of the jurors. Is there really a difference between selecting juries, which obviously there's a whole profession uh, within your profession to help you select juries that are more likely to give you a certain outcome versus judges. It, would you contrast that de that delta if there is one? Yeah, there there is a slight delta. Let me just say there are numerous factors that go into selecting jurors. For me, because I normally do discrimination law and labor and employment law, the the one discrete factor that's most important probably that separates the kind of juror I want from another juror is occupation and the experiences that go along with that occupation. The least important and one that's prohibited, of course, is race. Because what we find, I have jurors of every race 
on that pool or in the array, and we find that they have a broad range of uh, viewpoints, beliefs, and I've had jury foremen who are black, who, my goodness, these guys are, you know, the stereotype would be that they're more inclined to decide in favor of a plaintiff in a race, dis race discrimination case, and just the opposite is true. I find that race is among the least important qualities when it comes to selecting a juror. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would only ask unanimous consent that the article uh, written by uh, John McGinnis be placed in the record. Without objection. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. We will now hear from the gentleman from New York, the chairman of the full uh, committee, Ch uh, Chairman Natler, for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Judge Donald, we heard Judge Reeves call on Congress to be courageous in our commitment to diversity in the federal courts. What would courage from Congress look like to you when it comes to diversity in the courts? I think you're muted. Thank you, uh, Chairman Nadler, for that question. But um, Congress being courageous uh, to me would mean looking at people, diverse people, recognizing the pluralism of our nation and making certain that all voices are heard and that they're at the table. I believe that no one is advocating that we choose people based on race or gender, but what we're saying is people should not be excluded. They should not be denied the opportunity based on race and gender. And just as Congress was courageous in uh, appointing or confirming the first woman, the first African-American, the first Latinx, be courageous right now and look at the, the diversity that is, that is this country and give all of those quadrants an opportunity uh, to participate if they meet the other criteria. Well, thank you. Professor Sen, we heard Judge Chen recount story after story of how our judges' life experiences help their colleagues understand crucial elements of a case in ways they might otherwise have missed. Justice Ginsburg helped her colleagues to see how a strip search might feel to a, a teenage girl. Judge Henderson explained uh, that, sh that the shockingly racist graffiti a plaintiff described was far more common than his colleague apparently thought. Justice Thomas drew on the history of the Ku Klux Klan uh, to explain the meaning of a burning cross. Does your research support Judge Chen's message that, as he put it, there is a cost when voices are missing from the room? Um, not just my research, I would say, but a wide swath of research across political science and sociology and economics, I think, supports that view. So, uh, uh, I mean, I could just go kind of go through like a litany of studies on this point. But we do have a number of studies. For example, let's talk about gender. We have a, a number of examples kind of showing that um, you know, across employment discrimination cases or sexual harassment cases, that women judges tend to vote differently from their male counterparts. Um, so, so, for example, male judges are more likely to vote against a plaintiff in a sexual discrimination case, or that all male panels are more likely to vote a plaintiff against a plaintiff in a sexual discrimination case. But the inclusion of a woman onto that panel would actually bring the two groups closer together and actually eliminate some of those differences. Now, when I talk about the studies, I'm talking about quantitative analyses of thousands of votes across the Court of Appeals, to take one example. But we do see reflected in the data the nuances and the nuggets of those stories that were highlighted by people like Judge Chen. Um, we do see that in the large quantitative studies. Now, does that apply to everyone? No. Um, these are, you know, these are uh, kind of statistics that we're working with. So it's not going to explain the individual. It's not going to ex explain or predict any one individual judge. But we do see uh, kind of these broad patterns, um, these voices reflected in, in the numbers, actually. So yes. Well, thank, you. thank you. Judge Chen also, uh, Professor Hawkins, Judge Chen also compared the need for a diverse federal bench to the constitutional requirement that juries represent the fair cross-section of the community. How do the considerations that animate the fair cross-section requirement uh, support the importance of, of a, for juries? support the importance of a diverse federal judiciary. 
Thank you for that question, Chairman Nettler, especially because I've written about this and I've compared the considerations that we use and apply uh, a pretty uncontested in the jury context to the bench. Uh, juries serve as judicial decision makers, um, not unlike judges. One adjudicates facts, the other adjudicates the law. Um, and yet uh, we have this very explicit commitment to having jurors represent a fair cross section of the community. Um, we have lots of courts that make very deliberate efforts to ensure that not only um, that jury pools are diverse, but that jury panels are uh, sufficiently diverse to reflect the communities that they serve. Um, and I think that because we understand that the appearance of fairness in the process is what engenders the trust we need to legitimize the rule of law, um, that those appearances matter as we have an increasingly diverse nation. So just as we acknowledge expressly and engage in active uh, efforts to ensure diversity among jurors, we should do the same for judges. Thank you, Judge Chen, Judge Donald. Judge Chen, Judge Bailey, and Judge Reeves all discussed how diversity on the bench affects the wider judicial system from the selection of bankruptcy and magistrate judges, as well as key court personnel like clerks of the court or chief probation officers to local rules and programs. Do you agree with their assessment? I agree with that. I also think it affects clerks. And, and Chairman Nadler, when I became a bankruptcy judge in June of 1988, I became the first African-American woman to be a bankruptcy judge in the history of the United States. There were only nine nationwide. I was the only one in the South. I firmly believe that had it not been for the presence of judges uh, Nate Jones and Damon J. Keith on the Sixth Circuit, that I would never have had that opportunity. Yes, it matters. And also, those of us who are in those positions are more likely to hire diverse clerks. I, for one, I don't want to be surrounded by everyone who looks like me or thinks like me, because I think if that happens, there's no one to help me guard against uh, my own blind spots, and all of us have those blind spots. Thank you. Thank my you. time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, is not here, uh, then next up will be uh, Mr. Bishop, uh, the gentleman from North Carolina. You may begin, Ms. Uh, Representative Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Donald, I was uh, interested in your written comments, and there's this one paragraph, and it just sort of got me thinking about where what we're talking about. And it says, you say, I am sad to report today that despite significant recent progress in diversifying the legal profession, the federal judiciary is not yet visibly open to talented and qualified individuals from every corner of this great nation. As, exactly, as of exactly one year ago in March 2020, women accounted for only one third, 34 percent of Article III judgeships, despite amounting to more than half of the U.S. population. Similarly, African-Americans, Latinx, American, Americans, and Asian-Americans combined accounted for only 26% of federal jurists, while 40% of the country identifies as non-white. And I guess, Judge Donald, it prompts me to ask, what, do you, what is the objective? Is it to have a quota so that the, uh, you're not really, or not there until the numbers match the background population? I don't think that we will... Uh, that we necessarily have to have the numbers correlating, but I do think that we ought to have the presence of all those uh, those groups. Uh, one of the professors here today talked about the example, the Seventh Circuit, which today, uh, we know that that circuit includes cities like Chicago, Illinois, Gary, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and there, those are cities with high populations of people of color, and there is not a, an African-American on that court. We're not gonna, we, it's not necessary that we have those mirror images, but I do believe we ought to have influences on those, uh, on those courts. We ought to have that presence and those ideas and those lived experiences, uh, Representative uh, Bishop. Thank you, ma'am. And, and comparing though, if, we're, if we're, comparisons are made to the background population, of course, we're, we have to draw the judges from among lawyers who are admitted to bars. So um, it, it, isn't that really the more relevant comparison? I am so pleased that you acknowledge and mention that, uh, sir, because we are working mightily right now to work on pipeline. We need to make certain that we have opportunities to enter the practice of law afforded to many more students and their organizations and individuals uh, who are doing that. You know, in my own community, as Congressman Cohen will, will note, there were, when I came on the bench, there were many students who were in impoverished communities and others who had never met a lawyer. They'd never seen a lawyer. 
But, you know, I do my job as judge, but I also feel that I have a responsibility to my community to make certain that people's dreams are enlarged. Uh, you know, people cannot often exceed their dreams. They ought to have the ability to aspire to every position in this country. And when we when we go out and uh, and help to infuse diversity, we have to enlarge and inspire dreams. And those dreams can one day become a reality. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to, to that point, uh, one uh, concerned about how we make the pipeline better. Uh, there, you know, Asian Americans, uh, despite having increased their numbers and outscoring other applicants, have been uh, 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 disproportionately denied admission to Ivy League schools, particularly against Harvard. Uh, and, and I and I think that that was sustained, nonetheless, by the First Circuit as an appropriate first uh, appropriate affirmative action thing to do. Uh, the the administration recently dropped its support for for Asian Americans uh, discrimination. Uh, contentions against Yale. Uh, is it is it possible to um, discriminate against Asian Americans in Ivy League schools and yet improve the pipeline for um, Asian Americans make, getting access to judicial positions? Okay, so Congressman Bishop, I'm going to let one of the professors respond more narrowly to that. But when I talk about the pipeline, I'm talking about going as 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 deep as conditions in elementary schools and in high schools and in you know, exposing people to the law, it would be improper for me to comment on an issue that might come before my court. Uh, but I do understand the issue you're talking about, but I'm gonna let those who are in professors, those who are professors and those who sometimes live in the real, as well as the, the theoretical world, respond to that. Right. Very well. Um, Professor Hawkins, I might take a quick, uh, well, I've got about 30 seconds. Maybe you wanna comment on that. Uh, and also I, I, I've noticed that there, we've had a lot of, um, well, I'll leave it, try to not, not make it a compound question. Do you have a quick comment on that before my time expires? Uh, yes, thank you. First, I want to say that the underrepresentation of Asian Pacific Americans in uh, the federal courts is definitely a concern. However, that concern does not stem from the underrepresentation of uh, Asian Pacific Americans in college or in law school. Uh, they are actually overrepresented uh, among college students, um, and they are one of the fastest growing demographics among law school students as well. So it's not a pipeline program, uh, but I do agree that the underrepresentation on the bench is problematic. Thank you. My time has expired. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the next uh, up is the gentle lady from California, Congresswoman Lofgren, for five minutes. Congresswoman. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I um, wonder if I could ask Judge Donald. She said she had a, a story to tell if she got a chance to tell it. So uh, could you take just part of my five minutes and tell that story? And I will abbreviate it. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Lofton. Uh, gr I grew up in the, the segregated South. Um, so I've been in lots of situations where I was the only person who looked like me in the room. So when I became a judge in Shelby County, the clerk of court, a middle-aged white male, a friend of mine and a former friend of mine, he's deceased now, and, and Congressman Coins was uh, Gene Goldsby. He staffed my courtroom. I was the first African-American woman to become a judge in Tennessee's history. Mr. Goldsby was my friend. He was invested in my success. He wanted me to be comfortable. And so he staffed my courtroom with all African-American personnel. So when I opened court the first day uh, in that September of, of 1982, the first person on my docket to walk through the room was a young white male. He looked around the room, Congresswoman, his eyes grew as wide as half dollar bills as he knew no, as he saw no one who looked like him. Because of my own experiences of being the only person of a single, of a particular race in a space, I knew that he must've been feeling anxious. He asked me for a continuance, I granted it. He came back 30 days later with an African-American defense attorney. And, and based upon my belief that he was concerned that he could not get justice, in a place that, where no one looked like him, I went to Mr. Goldsby and thanked him, but I told him we need to change out some personnel and create a diverse environment, and that's what we did. And so that story is directly opposite to Mr. Bayless, but it, but it means that diversity is important, not just to people of color, 
but it's important to people in the majority race also. It's just that most people in the majority have never been in a situation where they were the minority unless they were in some foreign country. That's a, very, that's a fascinating and, and really beautiful story. Um, I uh, just, I know we have a long, <coughs> a long um, hearing and there are others behind me. So I'll just say, you know, this has been a very enlightening uh, panel for me. One of the things that in addition to uh, having a diversity in terms of ethnicity and gender, uh, we've just touched upon the need for diversity uh, geographically and educationally. And you just can't tell me that the only qualified people in America to be judges are white people who went to Harvard or Yale. I mean, that's just can't be true. And historically, it's not been true. When you take a look at Justice uh, Earl Warren, uh, he wasn't even uh, a judge when he was appointed. He went to uh, he grew, went to Bakersfield High School and he went to University of California, Berkeley Law School, and yet he made a profound change in America on, on the court. And I worry that the court has become more like a priesthood than it used to be. We used to reach out to talented lawyers um, who had life experiences, not only on the bench uh, as, as um, uh, you know, working their way up, uh, but also in uh, in business and in life and, and in politics broadly. I mean, Justice Douglas and others, we've lost that. So I think we need a diverse bench, a talented bench. And, we, and I think we all understand that that doesn't just mean men and it doesn't just mean white men, although I love white men, my husband and my son are, are are white men, um, but we need to have a bench that really reflects the full talent of America. And uh, I really appreciate the witnesses here today. And uh, Judge, it was a it was a treat to hear your story, and I'm glad I got a chance to ask you about it. Thank and you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. The gentle lady yields back. I'll now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Tiffany, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time today. And before we start, I just want to mention in regards to the technical difficulties that we had at the start of this, it is really time for us to get back to hearings in the United States Capitol. Had the same thing happen uh, with another committee that I sit on repeatedly. And it, this is not any of your fault, Mr. Chairman, as the subcommittee chairman here. But uh, it is time for us to get back to having these hearings in the United States Capitol, where we will have a Congress, a Congress where people get together. I'd just like to share my comments. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Today, this committee's message is we will judge you by the color of your skin, race, gender, and politics, not by your character or qualifications. Let's begin with the basic premise that exceptional qualifications, not race, skin, color, gender, or religion, should be the most important factor when evaluating a judicial nominee. Over the last few years, we have seen well-qualified and diverse nominations to the courts. However, because they were Republican nominations, the Democrats didn't think they were diverse enough. I would urge people to take a look at the list of the Trump nominees, which came from all different types of ethnicities and uh, stations in society that were put on the courts. It is a good record. Senator Whitehouse in 2019 referred to Judge Naomi Rao, the first Asian Pacific American woman to sit on the DC circuit as a cartoon of a fake judge, despite her well-qualified rating by the American Bar Association. She did not receive one single Democrat vote. When Judge Janice Brown, an exceptionally qualified African-American woman, was nominated to the federal bench, Senator Schumer called her the least worthy pick. Despite her qualification as a judge coming from the California Supreme Court, even then, Senator Biden voted against her nomination. The truth is simple. The only times my Democrat colleagues believe someone meets their diversity test 
is when they are ideologically aligned. The same is true when gender issues are involved. One need not look further than the nomination of an exceptionally qualified woman, Justice Barrett. She was openly attacked for her religion, and no one on the left said a word. The message that day, she was not diverse enough because she was nominated by former President Trump. This is less about diversity and more about furthering radical progressive agendas. As I understand it, the, prop the composition of our Article III judges roughly represents the racial diversity of our nation. Nomination to the bench should not be decided by identity politics, but instead by qualifications. These men and women administer our laws. Ladies, justice is blindfolded for a reason because justice is blind. I would just go on to say, Mr. Chairman, I, I thought you did a good job of acknowledging the improvements that have been done. A couple of our judges that spoke earlier spoke very eloquently about the numerous success stories. We are moving in the right direction, and that is really a good thing. And if you look at the uh, list of President Trump's judges, that continuation happened over the last four years. And if you take, we can cherry pick that, all of us, but you could take a look at the Wisconsin uh, State Supreme Court. Six of the seven judges are women which I would say people see as progress in our state and a good thing to point out. I do agree with you um, and our ranking member, Mr. Issa, in regards to there are some places that are overrepresented. And let's talk about the elephant in the room that we're talking about the Ivy League. And that's not just the courts, but all of our federal government. We could use more people that from are from throughout our country. So uh, if I can take, I don't have the timer in front of me, Mr. Chairman, but I want to put one quick question out to Mr. Kirsenau. Mr. Kirsenau, you referred to two senators, United States senators yesterday, Duckworth and Hirono, that came out and said that they will not vote for non-diverse candidates. Do you think that it is wise to extend that to judicial nominations? Mr. Personnel, you need to unmute. Apologies once again. Um, in two decades on the Civil Rights Commission, one of the things I've observed is the decline in public trust in institutions. And it's correlated to some extent with the perception that we're counting by impermissible qualities. And the most impermissible of all is race, but that's not the defining thing that has eroded trust, but it's one of those things. And if someone is going to say very overtly, I'm not voting for somebody because of their race, that is something that is so anathema to our civic ethos as, as to be astonishing. And I think we've been talking a lot about having a diverse judiciary, which I think a lot everybody here agrees with, uh, as somehow engendering trust in the public. One of the uncontroverted ways of eroding that trust is giving the public perception that you're counting on the basis of race or people are getting onto the judiciary because of race. And for those who are saying that, and I'm not saying anyone here is doing that, but for those broadly who say that, no, we're not doing that, we saw the same dynamic pertain in Grutter and Graz versus Bollinger, where the court said race is just one of many factors, a feather on the scale in the admissions process. But when you look in at the data, it's not a feather on a scale, it's an anvil at some schools, Black and Hispanic students are up to 500 times more likely to be admitted over their white and Asian comparatives. What we must not do under any circumstances, in my estimation, is erode the trust that some people have talked about very eloquently as being engendered by a diverse judiciary by making it appear as if race is a factor in the process of selecting candidates. Mr. Chairman, I really... Gentlemen's yeah. time has expired. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, I thought you did a really good job of laying this out today. We all seek a more perfect union, as it said in the founding. We had so much work to do. We are now get, we continue to move towards that more perfect union. And I really appreciate having this hearing today to talk about this important issue. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. And uh, our next uh, questioner will be the gentleman from California, Mr. Lou, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson, for holding this important hearing. 
I previously served in active duty in the United States military because I believe America is an exceptional country. We're not perfect, but we're moving towards that more perfect union. And one of the areas we have to look at is the federal judiciary. And let me simply start by noting that the highest federal court in the land, the United States Supreme Court, does not have a single Asian American on that court. Not only that, but not a single Asian American was even seriously considered to be on that court in both Democratic and Republican administrations. And the message that sends is that lawyers and judges and law professors that look like me are somehow not qualified to be on the U.S. Supreme Court. And that is just wrong. And when you look at the district courts, for example, Asian Americans are 3.5% in terms of federal district court judges, well below our population in the United States. And again, the message that sends is that lawyers and state court judges and law professors that look like me are somehow not qualified to be federal district court judges. And I want people to understand that when you have a federal judiciary that is 73% white and male, far above that actual population of white males, and then you say, the reason is because of merit. You're sending the message that minorities are less qualified, more stupid, less good to be judges, to be on the federal judiciary. That is what is so corrosive about not diversifying the federal judiciary. And it's not about the specific federal judge. I listen to Judge Ho very closely. I admire he's the only Asian American on that circuit court, but it's not about him. He is not there just because of merit because there are dozens, likely hundreds of other people who could be in his exact same position and be just as qualified. Because there's so few federal judiciary positions, there are literally thousands of people that could fill these positions that are not white and male. And to somehow suggest that the only reason it is white and male is because those people are the most exceptionally qualified is a lie. There is discrimination happening because if you took the most qualified people and sorted them out, it wouldn't look like this. And that's what we need to address. Now, Commissioner Kirstenau, you also had a similar line of testimony that somehow the way it looks like this is because of merit. You also, by the way, made a false fact about the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It is not the most reverse circuit. PolitiFact has checked this, other people have. In fact, the Sixth Circuit is the most reverse circuit. So setting that aside, uh, because I did mention you in your, your testimony, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond. Where I'm coming from is not the individual judges or, or the federal judiciary. It is a message that is being sent to America that somehow minorities are not qualified to be on the federal judiciary because somehow we're not exceptionally qualified. Thank you, you Congressman, for the opportunity to respond. I agree with you entirely that if there is discrimination, it's against Asian Americans. In fact, just yesterday or the day before yesterday, I filed a brief in the Students for Fair, Fair Admissions against Harvard case in the Supreme Court. Stop bringing in irrelevant issues. There are more Asian Americans at these Ivy Leagues. Exactly but in the right. federal district, are. underrepresented. It's these are different issues happening. So just answer my question about Asian Americans in the federal district or minorities in the federal district because it is underrepresented. It is Don't bring in these college issues. This is not what the hearing's about. Underrepresented, definitely. Underrepresented based on the fact that there's been discrimination in the pipeline that we've been talking about. Profound discrimination against Asian Americans. Without question, profound discrimination. And it's one of the reasons why I indicated before we have an erosion in confidence in the institutions because the perception by the public is we are making determinations on the basis of race. One of the most baleful and anathema considerations we have in the United States of America because of history. It's precisely why I say we must avoid at all costs the perception that decisions are being made on the basis of race. And when you look at the correlative with how decision making is being made in the admissions process, it appears as if decisions in large part are being based- We're not talking about admissions process, we're talking about the federal judiciary the fact that it's 73% white and male means decisions were being made on the race of the applicant. And that is simply a fact because it not statistically would not have come out as 73% white and male. And the reason that you can't talk about the federal judiciary and you keep going to the college issue is because you know you have no basis on the issue of the federal judiciary. It just needs to be more diverse. It's corrosive to America to have a entire third branch of government in which people were selected on the basis of them being white. That's the only way to explain these statistics. I yield back. I thank the uh, 
gentleman for his impassioned uh, argument. And uh, we will next turn to the gentleman from Wisconsin, um, Mr. Fitzgerald for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, um, I appreciate uh, Judge Donald being with us today. It's an honor. And um, I, I think my frustration uh, kind of with uh, not just the discussion today, but overall this, this, this uh, back and forth that's been going on, the diversity, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure who would not be for that. Um, but it, I was in the state legislature for many years before I was elected to Congress. And what we experienced in Wisconsin, and, and Judge Down, you kind of re, you talked a little bit about Milwaukee earlier, but the frustration we had was that oftentimes the legislature in Wisconsin would would pass a bill and the governor would sign it into law and immediately would end up in the Western District or the Eastern District. And, um, we, you know, we kind of would get into a situation where we would, we'd know kind of where, where we were headed and and how the judge was going to handle something. And it, it was, it clearly was based on, uh, they had kind of developed an ideology. And and, and if, if there was kind of this gambit of which judge you might be before, you know, I think most of us could kind of accept that. But there seemed to be, I'm gonna call it a dysfunction and, 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 and maybe that's uh, close to being accurate, maybe it isn't, but it was about the back and forth between what was going on in the Eastern or Western District and the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, um, where there was just a delay in action or a delay in ruling. And, and for me, it seems more about longevity of judges, federal judges, and how long they're there, which can be a long time. And, and oftentimes I think people get entrenched and they kind of start, you know, understanding this is the profile of this judge and and they're not going to vary from that so you know for from my perspective as a republican congressman i'm like we need more conservative judges we need more uh more judges that are going to rule based on the merits of the case and instead of uh you know taking one ideology or other and obviously the criticism that comes from a lot a lot of members of my party is just the idea that you know, there's too many federal judges that are legislating from the bench versus uh, really taking kind of a fair look at it. And I, you know, so I, I just wanted to take that kind of a, a different, a different look at it. But there still seems to be a back and forth between what's going on in the states and in the circuit, federal circuit uh, courts that seems to be resolved. And and I don't know what those, I don't know how we're going to do that or how we could tackle that. And I just. I'd just be interested to, to hear your take on that. And I think you're muted, Judge. That question is directed to whom, sir? To Judge Donald. Okay. So, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald, I can appreciate your uh, expressed frustration with um, the the uh, sometimes I guess the the friction or whatever between the various branches, and and I think that's the genius of the founders to have these uh, separate branches. I know that sometimes the courts are frustrated with uh, legislative matters and legislatures are frustrated with things that happen in the court. I I believe though, and I, and I I believe this firmly to the core because of the oath that I took that judges come to these issues with a view to determining the law based on the facts. I think we try to look at the laws and sometimes if there's an ambiguity and we have to try to decide what Congress meant by a particular law, I think that we use the appropriate tools of a statutory and other interpretation to do the best we can to find that and then apply that law. I can appreciate that there are you know, perhaps some ideological differences in the way judges come to uh, these things. And I can't speak to those individual differences in any court. But I do believe that the courts and, and judges generally come to this job seeking to honor and uphold uh, the oath that they take with respect to applying the law. And I also believe that we try to make certain that we give fidelity to uh, the framework that the founders set up with these separate and co-equal branches 
and the respective obligations of each. Thank you very much. A fascinating day and a fascinating hearing. I, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald. Uh, next up is the Congressman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Council will be serving as today's moderator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Firstly, I'd like to agree. And, uh, before you start, Mr. Cohen, let me ask that all members mute their uh, phones. We're hearing uh, commentary from, sounds like Fox News. We encourage all cities to apply for if, our if, readiness challenge. If, whoever, whoever there needs to un okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to agree uh, with my colleague from Wisconsin that we should be having in-person hearings, but we can't do that as Speaker Pelosi's made clear until enough of the Congress members have taken shots, vaccinations to make us be safe in our committees. And I believe it's about half of the members on the other side who have not taken their tests. And that's why we can't go back to our hearings like we'd like. So if they would just roll up their sleeves and allow a little needle to be put in their arm to protect them from this pandemic, we could all be back together again. I look forward to that. Secondly, uh, the, as far as the people that criticize Harvard and Yale, yeah, Judge Barrett went to Rhodes College a Rhodes Scholar from Memphis, so we're proud of that. Judge Donald, uh, you've seen the fact that federal judiciary is never as diverse as it should be, and over the past four years, which direction have we gone in? We've gone the wrong direction. Out of 226 judges appointed by Donald Trump, only 24% were women and only 16% were non-white. And when you look at the appeals court where you sit, Judge Donald, the statistics are just astonishingly worse. Zero black appeals court judges were appointed by Trump. Zero out of about 65. He couldn't find one black judge out of 65 who would qualify based because he does everything according to some of these people based on qualifications. Not a single qualified black person, unbelievable. No Hispanic appeals court either, none. This is important because as we look at our life experiences, judges are no different and Trump basically put white people in control because it was all about changing the balance of power. Judge Donald, you have a judge a seat at the district court and the circuit court levels. You've had that. You've heard appeals court cases with panels and judges interacting with each other and deciding cases. How did judges' life experiences play into the deliberative process and how, if at all, has that been, uh, was it different at the trial court level versus the appellate court level? Well, obviously, thank you, Congressman Cohen. At the trial court level, I sat as a, a sole decision maker. Um, and in, in trials, of course, with juries, I had a jury there to be the decider of the fact, but it did not uh, rely on any kind of collaborative or deliberative process between judges. I was a sole decision maker. At the appellate court, I sit with panels, uh, sit in panels of three or sometimes with an unbunked court. And all of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, uh, we, to some degree, rely on lived experiences. We all study the same black letter law. But then in interpreting and applying that law, those, those lived experiences are, are brought to bear. And for people who say, well, that's wrong, but how else could it be um, if, if all of us, if, I mean, if the black letter law was all that we relied on, then we would not have um, minority and majority opinions on an issue because we would all see everything the same way. We would look at the law the same way. So those lived experiences help us to round out and 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 factor in all the considerations uh, of um, of the uh, the law that we're sitting and looking. So it's important because we have we have a back and forth, and we put all of those uh, those views about cases and come to hopefully a richer experience. And sometimes. And I would say this, most of the decisions on our court are unanimous. Uh, most of our decisions are unanimous. And I think it's probably that way on most courts. But there are times when we look at those issues and based on our reading of the law and our shared, uh, our lived experiences, we come to different results as all courts do. Thank you, Judge. You have a rare background for a federal judge and one that's really people should be envious of. You got your degrees from the University of Memphis, 
My alma mater is well for law school. You worked at Memphis Area Legal Services to provide legal assistance for those who couldn't otherwise afford it. As a public defender, you did the same thing. Do you find that that background useful in your deliberative process? Uh, how do you think having a more diverse judiciary, particularly with respect to educational professional experiences, would affect judicial de decision making? I think those experiences, Congressman Cohen, were an, they were and are enormously uh, important. You know, we have not talked about one dimension of diversity, and that's socioeconomic diversity. I represented people, poor people, who otherwise had no voice. I went into the criminal courts and stood as the voice and the advocate for people accused with the government against them and only an advocate uh, representing them. It is important that we have not only the prosecutorial perspective um, that the judges experience, but also the defense perspective. And to be a public interest lawyer is a component that we don't often find in judges, but it is an important and critical component. And I think it also helps lend legitimacy uh, and it also helps with the perception of justice by the people that we seek to serve. Thank you, Thank Judge you. Donald. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, we will next uh, hear from the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Bentz. Mr. Bentz, if you would turn your camera on, you will be recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for this most interesting discussion. I would like to start with Judge Donald. Um, I, I was the part of a, of a commission to vet uh, applicants to the uh, to the uh, federal district court in the Northwest and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I asked that the applicants, uh, uh, that the doorway to apply uh, for consideration be opened again because I felt we had too few applicants. As a result, the number doubled and I, I won't go into detail other than to say I was uh, disturbed by the by the lack of minority participation in that application process. Um, I know that when I went to law school many years ago, the, the number of women in my class was perhaps 20%. Today, I understand that about 54.9% of law students are female. Uh, you mentioned in your, in your discussion, the focus on the pipeline. And I would like you to go back to that for just a moment and share with us what you think needs to be done so that we can advance the interests of minorities um, as well as has uh, successfully as has been the case with female applicants. Absolutely, thank you for this opportunity. Well, I, I think that first of all, I wanna speak specifically to the point you mentioned about the selection process there. Often when people look in an area and they don't see that there is a, a history of people who look like them being considered, uh, they simply won't apply and go through the process. It's a daunting process. And why go through all of that if there's no opportunity that you might uh, get selected? But on the pipeline issue, it starts early on. There are many places where people don't know a lawyer. Let me give you an example of what's going on in Memphis. Uh, we have a program where uh, law firms and corporations uh, will put uh, will support this this position where they will allow high school students to go through a work training program and then have a summer internship in the law department, either at the corporation or in the law firm. They're paid a modest stipend, but it gives them exposure and experience not only to lawyers, but also to uh, the area of law. We have had a number of people who've gone through that program express interest. At the American Bar Association, we have the Legal Opportunity Minority, Legal Opportunity Minority Scholarship for first generation lawyers, you would not believe the number of individuals in this country who have never had a lawyer in their family. So we provide scholarships for people to help front the cost uh, of the expense of law school and also to provide mentors. We judges are have a judicial intern um, opportunity program to help students get placed as internships. Judges from all across the country band together to uh, do a program where we help law students understand the importance of clerkships and train them in that. Those are some of the pipelines, but we got to do more at the base at those uh, elementary um, schools where when students are first uh, getting started to help them understand and envision a future that might include the law. Thank you. And, and now for, Pro for Professor, Professor Hawkins. Uh, the, there's been not much discussion about where people want to go, but not too much about how to get there. Uh, perhaps, and this my question about the pipeline is one, one focus, 
uh, perhaps you could share with us what changes in law you would recommend uh, to uh, address the issues we've been discussing today. Do you mean the rule of law, Congressman? Yes, I mean the rule of law or, or any, uh, we know that, that much of that which has been discussed is, is, is uh, challenging to achieve by virtue of rules we've heard, laws that apply, that we've heard from many t discussing the issues today saying, hey, well, you can't discuss race. Uh, so what would you do to help uh, address these issues? Any, would you do anything on the law side or is this all about uh, in encouraging as opposed to um, passing laws? Well, I appreciate the question because I think that one of the important things that we have to do is preserve existing law. So currently the Supreme Court precedent is Grutter v. Bollinger and that precedent acknowledges the compelling interest in diversity. Um, now that's uh, in respect to higher education, but nevertheless, it's reasonable to assume and certainly lower courts have found applying that precedent that diversity is a compelling interest across a wide range of government contexts, um, including in the employment context. So. Um, certainly, there are people who think that the rule of law in Grutter is threatened uh, by the current Supreme Court, and I think what's really important is not just to preserve the existing recognition that diversity is, in fact, a compelling interest and can be pursued uh, uh, in ways that are legally defensible and that are narrowly tailored, but to extend that explicitly outside of the context of higher education to employment practices and other domains. Thank you for the clarity of your answer, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we will next hear from the gentleman, gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Mondair Jones, for five minutes. Uh, Congressman Jones. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, for your leadership, as always, and for holding this important hearing today. Uh, and thank you to all of our witnesses on both of our distinguished panels. As Judge Reeves stated in his written testimony, our judiciary may soon face, quote, a crisis of legitimacy. As he wrote, one reason is that, quote, as our country becomes more diverse, our courts are becoming more homogeneous. As an openly gay black attorney who grew up in Section 8 housing and on food stamps, I know how important it is that the judges who serve the American people truly represent the American people. When I entered law school in 2010, I hardly ever saw myself represented in the legal profession, let alone on the federal bench. At that time, there was only one openly gay Article III judge. When I graduated law school, there still was not a single openly gay black man on the bench. Nor before this Congress had there been one in this body. It is for that reason that growing up, I never imagined someone like me could even run for Congress, let alone get elected. And make no mistake, descriptive representation drives substantive representation. Who serves in our government shapes who our government serves. When decisions about us are made without us, underrepresented communities pay the price. And there is a reason for that. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are all shaped by our life experiences. That of course does not by any stretch of the imagination mean that we can presume how a judge will vote simply because of their race gender or sexual orientation. I understand that and I agree with those individuals who have expressed concerns about that presumption. But we are dishonest with ourselves if we think that the lack of judicial diversity in this country does not impact judicial decision making. As Professor Sin and Professor Hawkins have shown us today, it does. Look no further than the Supreme Court's cases on LGBTQ rights. I think the court's slow progress with respect to LGBTQ rights is because not enough people on the court have seen the humanity in members of the LGBTQ community. As a decade of research on what is called contact theory shows, personal relationships with LGBTQ people increase support for LGBTQ rights. Does anyone really think that if there were openly LGBTQ justices on the Supreme Court, LGBTQ people like me would have to spend every June anxiously waiting to see if the Supreme Court will vote to take away our civil rights? If there were openly LGBTQ justices on the Supreme Court, does anyone really think it would have taken until June 2015 for the court to recognize my constitutional right to marry who I love? Or until June of 2020 for the court to rule that federal law prohibits employers from firing someone for being gay or trans? 
Does anyone really think that if there were even one openly LGBTQ justice, Justice Scalia would have compared LGBTQ people to child abusers in an address a few months after his dissent in Obergefell? Justice Scalia once wrote that one of his votes against LGBTQ rights was not of immense personal importance to him. Well, that might explain why he was so comfortable voting to uphold statutes criminal, criminalizing gray, gay intimacy and prohibiting marriage equality. We need more judges who see the humanity in all people, who understand the human stakes of their decisions. We need more judges for whom the law is personal. And with my time left, Professor Hawkins, can you highlight for us how descriptive representation improves the judicial decisions that most directly affect underrepresented communities? Um, absolutely. Thank you, Congressman Jones. Um, your description was quite excellent, um, but you're right. There is research that shows um, across a wide range of bureaucratic contexts, including the bench, that when there is racial congruence between constituents and representatives, that there are um, more responsive outcomes. This is what we call accountability. This is why I said that um, it improves judicial accountability to minority communities when we have a diverse bench. Um, and we know that not because, as so many people have said already, um, race, gender, ethnicity, LGBTQ status, or any other dimension of identity necessarily dictates outcomes. It is because they influence experience and perspectives, um, and they make people more able to relate the people who come before the court and before the government um, to plead their case or to seek some sort of uh, redress. And so that's what makes um, descriptive representation uh, translate into substantive representation and what I would call political accountability. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Congressman Jones. Uh, last but not least, the gentle lady from North Carolina Congresswoman Ross is recognized for five minutes, and that is, uh, she will be the end unless uh, another member appears. Uh, oh. Congresswoman Ross, you may proceed. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. And I thought, I think this has been a fantastic hearing. And I think coupled with the hearing that we had a couple weeks ago, about expanding the federal judiciary, that um, it might be just a, a sweet spot in time for taking care of two issues that are crucial to the better administration of justice in this country. Um, my question um, is for both of our professors who have done a lot of research. And so I'm curious about, um, whether I, I I understand and it is clear that we dis we have a disproportionate number of um, men um, and white men who are on the federal bench. My question is: um, Are they retiring, uh, or are they? How long do they stay around? And um, because I think because these are lifetime appointments, we have fewer opportunities coming up for anybody else. And so I want to think about when will these opportunities come up and um, how um, and how age um, diversity is affected. Um, there, these are these are really important questions. So generally, the for the Court of Appeals, the average age at investiture is around 50 years old, and for district court judges, it's been closer to 40. But I think that's actually slipped downward over time so that we're appointing younger judges who then serve longer terms. So to, to kind of concretely answer your question, these opportunities aren't going to come around all that often, given that judges are serving longer and, and longer terms. Um, there are some papers kind of on looking at looking at judges age and like that's another characteristic that kind of factors into here. You might think that younger judges are actually like kind of more well connected to kind of social developments and um, more sensitive to components of diversity, for example, LGBTQ status than older judges as younger generations are more embracing of the LGBTQ community. So that's something that that people have looked at and have found. And, and I would, Hawkins, yeah, yes, thank sorry. you. No, I would add to that um, the fact that what we really have is this 
artificial scarcity in terms of the seats available to be filled. And we have really an abundance of qualified candidates. I think it was Congressman Liu who said, this is not really about having an inadequate supply. This is about having the kind of deliberate and conscious commitment to improving the diversity on the bench. Because as you said, there are so few seats that come available given life tenure. And as Professor Sen said, the age of judges at investiture is actually going down. I believe research shows that President Trump um, had the lowest average age um, at the time of appointment. Um, and so we know that these opportunities are few and far between. And because that, there are usually robust candidate pools that are available, rich with not only well-qualified candidates, but very diverse candidates. So this is not really a pipeline problem. This is an appointment problem. And we really just have to be deliberate and conscious about the commitment, just like Jimmy Carter did. When he said, I'm going to do this, it happened. And so to follow up, this committee had a hearing on the need to expand the federal bench, particularly at the district court level because of the caseloads and because of population increases. If we did that, would that be something that would provide the opportunity for all of these qualified candidates to be considered so that it wouldn't be such a, a small number that we could then um, have much more of a balance because we would have so many more opportunities to um, fill those positions? I think the answer is yes. And I think, look, you, we could make a huge impact here with a small number. So for example, going to like the number of, of Native American judges, which is just two, right? We could add one more and that would actually increase the percentage of Native Americans on the federal bench by 50%, right? So small numbers could have a huge impact here. And I, I think that speaks to your point. This is a great opportunity to do that. I echo that. Again, scarcity is really the problem. It's the scarcity of opportunities that present prevents us, in addition to the will, right, the political will to do this. But once we have the political will, the scarcity of opportunity is another impediment. So expanding the uh, uh, federal uh, court system is certainly a way to expand those opportunities and reduce that artificial scarcity. Well, wonderful. Maybe we'll get around to doing that for the first time in 30 years. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentle lady and I also thank the witnesses for their appearance, for their testimony and for their time. Deeply uh, thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair. This concludes today's hearing. Mr. Chair, point uh, of personal privilege. I think the yes, claim yes. was made that I lied to the committee about the reversal rates of the six of the Ninth Circuit. I want to reemphasize that the Ninth Circuit over the last 25 years is the most reversed circuit by the Supreme Court. Well, I think that the figures speak for themselves and it's a matter of ideology that the Ninth Circuit has been so overruled over the years more than any other uh, circuit. Uh, so that is a matter of ideology as opposed to competence. Uh, there's no question about that. And so uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.